Hey friends, how are you going? Mark Hummer here today. What we're going to talk about today is the Z9. We've had some very exciting releases and updates of information from Nikon, so that's quite exciting to review that. We've also got some uh, reviews of other products I've spoken about recently, such as this uh, DNO light and also the uh, feet mount for the 70 to 200 zoom. So I'd like to run you through some uh, modifications and details on that that I've come up with recently. Uh, I've always got new toys that I'm buying and new little fixtures which I'd like to show you through. And so what we'll do is we'll start you off on the 70 to 200 actually. Now this is quite an interesting thing. I had a comment from a viewer who uh, noticed my little uh, contraption. And I'd uh, shown them how the screw on little uh, foot mount here, collar, uh, I put a little handle on it and this uh, handle made it much easier to grip so it becomes something that was very comfortable to hold. It had all the little uh, accessory mounts here, quarter inch and three eighths. So I could mount monopods or tripod mounts or anything I want to it. Uh, but uh, the comment was made that they'd gone from a Kirk system and they found that the Kirk foot mount uh, solved all their needs like that anyway. And uh, you know, I'm always open to uh, listen to someone else's ideas and so I purchased this thing immediately upon them telling me about it. And uh, I've got it now on my 70 to 200 right now as we speak. So here it is here mounted. It's the Kirk system one. I can just show you or just take it off. So this is not the original Nikon one at all. Oh, I hope if I undo the right knob, wouldn't it? There we go, we'll loosen that one off, and I'll pull it forward, and there it comes off. And so I can show you this one up. I'll show you some close-up photos, of course, uh, later on for it. Come up, pop up in the corners of the screen. But it's a little uh, Kirk system one. It was around uh, $95 US, I think it was. Uh, there were some fees for shipping because I'm bringing it to Australia, so it made it a little bit more expensive for me. But the bottom line is, it is everything that it's wrapped up to be. Now, I had a look at the Kirk website. There was probably nothing else I'd ever want to buy from there. Uh, not that it was bad, it just doesn't suit my needs. But this thing was particularly exciting. Now, why is it so interesting? Well, mostly because it's a little big, bigger than the original. So if you can compare the two here together, you see them side by side, you can see the original Nikon one is quite smaller. Forgetting the handle that I've added on, you can see the overall dimensions. It's a bit smaller and narrower, the original Nikon unit. And so this one here I've found to be a little bit more better in the hand. So when you're gripping it, it's a better grip and a bit more solid. Uh, secondly, I like the overall build quality of it. It looks very professional and fits on nice and tight and does everything it's got to do. Of course, it does have uh, some mounting holes underneath if you wish to put a monopod or a tripod mount or something on it. But what I really like about it is that the fact it's also already got the Arco Swiss mount arrangement included inside the design of it. So it's already a ball head uh, mount. So that means I don't have to worry about putting an accessory on it. It's already built into the unit. So having the Arco Swiss mount, the holes for other accessories, the fact that it's bigger and quite solid and robust, well, I think that's a better unit. So I've upgraded from the original Nikon one. Now, I was complaining that there was a rattle. So I put it up there to the microphone. I gave it a little jerk. You could hear a rattle. Now, let me tell you a little bit about that rattle. I actually worked out when I was mounting this one what the rattle was from. And the rattle really has nothing to do with that Nikon mount at all, which I thought it was. I'm happy to upgrade it because it was a bit too small and I liked the bigger unit with the Kirk system. But it wasn't actually a fault in the construction of this. The fault was in the manufacturing from Nikon in the actual mount that it goes into. So on this uh, unit here, the little swiveling uh, collar mount that works very good, there's uh, four screws that mount this little base down. And you probably never pick them up, I'd have to zoom in on it for you to get a photo. But there's four tiny little screws, Phillips head screws, that hold that plate in. And what they've done is when I bought this unit, they were loose. Now I know that because I've only had the thing around six months and I haven't used it that much. And in that time, for all four screws to come loose can only mean one thing. And that is Nikon never screwed them down tight in the first place. Now I will say, in all fairness to Nikon, I've owned Nikon equipment uh, for 30 years. I've never had a loose screw before. But unfortunately for me, when I purchased this particular unit, that's what I ended up getting. So I ended up with uh, something that was loosely fitted and that's why it was rattling. So it wasn't actually a manufacturing fault, it was more of a production fault. They just didn't tighten them down. So all I needed was a simple fillet head screwdriver and tighten them down and got rid of that little clicky noise that was going on and wobble. Now I will say this though, and I'm not advising this to anyone because this is like making it a bit of a permanent fixture if you like, but in those threads, having noticed once that they were loose, I never want that to happen again. So I used a little bit of a Loctite solution. So just as like a thread locker. Now I used a very weak thread locker and very little of it, just smearing over the thread. And that's just enough to make sure they don't vibrate loose. 
so it'll never come loose again. Now say I'm not encouraging anybody to use a thread locker on a Nikon product because it's going to void your warranty most likely. But for me, I know that uh, I know what I'm doing. I do, am a tradesman myself and I'm quite used to using these sorts of equipment and I'm capable of uh, doing that in a way that doesn't damage the lens. So I'm very comfortable with it. Now so when I want to mount the uh, Kirk uh, frame there, I can put that on, it stays on nice and secure. You'll see it has a little button for release, but that only works when you unlock it. And now I find this is very good on the camera. So you can hold it nice and steady, you can still rotate the lens and body of the camera using this unit. Another feature I like of the fact that it's a little bit bigger is that when you put the lens and camera down, it actually stays flat. It doesn't wobble around. So I like the fact that it sits mounts flat and sturdy and very safe. With this one was so small as a base, it would tend to wobble over and fall over very easily. So you can actually rest the whole lens just on the mount now because it's a broader unit and a bit more strong. So uh, I'm loving that. I just thought I'd uh, review that one to make sure that any uh, sort of uh, misconceptions that I might have put forward that there was a fault with Nikon uh, in its uh, construction. Well, it's really just uh, someone didn't tighten those screws. Now they're tight. It's all well. So if you hear a little rattle in your one, you know what it is now. You go into that base, tighten up those four screws and you'll be fine. Now another little detail I want to talk about, not relating to the lens, was this light. I'd shown this light the other week. Uh, this is a great uh, light, LED panel, 180 watt panel. And so what I've done here is I've noticed that uh, if I have the barns on it and I want to use that softbox, it's very awkward to put on because the advice from the company is you take off the barn doors and then you can fit the softbox around the edges of the light. Now that's uh, fine, I understand that principle, but I don't want to remove the barn doors. I actually like to have them on for when I need them. But that's not something I have to put on, off, on, off, and remember whether I've brought it along with me or not. I just want them always permanently there. And plus they're a nice safe feature to protect the, uh, the uh, LED panels as well. So what I've done is to make the whole softbox arrangement very simple and uh, efficient, uh, rather than have complicated clamps. Now I did mention the other day that I was using uh, clamps to mount the softbox. It was quick and simple and was an easy fix. But I have a better solution now. So let me just show you the better solution I've come up with. Uh, those with keen eyes will probably already see it onto the, uh, onto the mat box there, the barn doors. But when you open up this softbox that so comes with the unit, I'll just do that now. It just pops out very simply. Now of course I'm in the little area here so it's all looking a lot more awkward than it is. But what I've done is you open it up, which only took a few seconds, I've placed some Velcro on the edges here of the softbox, some Velcro around the perimeter here of the mat barn doors, and when I open the barn doors up nice and flat, what happens now is I just line up the Velcro, which is like pop, 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 very quick, and I'm assuming that they're all connected, and there you go. And there it is, it's up and running and, and it's going to work very efficiently and doesn't take any tools or extra equipment. So a bit of Velcro on either side of the units and that's made everything work. So I can turn this on now. And there we go, we've got a lovely softbox arrangement. And you see the light there coming from me. That's quite powerful, I think it's on its full power at the moment. But it's, it's nice to have the softbox option when you want it. So I just thought I'd run you through that uh, functionality. But uh, I like the light. The, don't really need a softbox because it's quite a broad soft panel anyway but isn't it nice to be able to have a softbox on have it nice and close to your subject and you can take some photos or if you're taking video of a headshot and you want it extra soft and a bit more easier on the eyes of the subject but that popped on and also pops off so quickly and easily so when you can put something on take it off put it on you know in a matter of seconds like that how awesome is that name me another uh, LED light panel in which you can put on the softbox in about three seconds. Mm, there isn't one, is there? No. This is the only system I've ever seen where you can get a softbox put onto your uh, LED light panel and have it done in a few seconds with no bother at all. So I think this is actually a great unit. It's a very clever design they've come up with. They've really thought it through. And uh, this softbox design here that uh, collapses down so very quick and easy as well. You can store it away. There you go, just like a little diffusion panel, it folds up away. And then you put it back in this little bag within a few seconds. And you can have it up and you can have it down in just a minute or two and no fuss and bother and no mess and no tools or equipment needed as well. So I think the Velcro around the um, barn doors 
that's the way to go to fit that on as quickly as possible with at least the least amount of fuss. So uh, recently we've just had the Z9 announced and a few little sneak previews of its performance and it is a very impressive camera. I think we're going to have a world class product there for Nikon. It's definitely the pro level camera people have been waiting for for a long time. Uh, but is it for me personally? I don't think so. Uh, all these uh, wonderful features that it has that are amazing and quite uh, special are not the sort of things that I need in a camera at uh, my situation. So the Z7 II does everything I need and I'm quite pleased with it. The only downside for the Z7 II is that still Nikon have not released a sufficient firmware upgrades to make the autofocus as good as I would like it for video. Obviously for photos it's no issue. I use a lot of single point fo focusing anyway, so that doesn't concern me and it works really well. But for video autofocus and for tracking moving objects for example, well that's where I'd really think we need an autofocus upgrade on these existing cameras. So yes, it's wonderful that the Z9 has this fabulous autofocus system and uh, will do everything that its competitors can do and probably even more than that. Uh, it's an exceptional camera by the look of it. Uh, but uh, I'm disappointed, I will say, that we've had to wait multiple years with the Z7 system and Z6 system and still have an inferior uh, focus system with autofocus on video to uh, the competitors. So uh, making us wait till after the Z9 is released to then maybe get a trickle down even months later and it still not be quite as good as the Z9 but better, well that's, that's fantastic in the future but we really should have had that sort of thing happening uh, right now. It's a bit rude to make us wait after we've already spent the money. So people may or may not buy this Z9. I reckon only about 1 in 10 uh, loyal Nikon photographers will invest the $10,000 Australian or 7000 US on this Z9 camera, which is a very specialty camera and very expensive camera. Uh, so that's all very well for those who can afford that in pro level, but it's almost like that they're uh, mocking us uh, poor semi-pros or pro amateurs or whatever you want to call us. Uh, who have spent a great deal of money upgrading to the Z system and not really getting everything we were promised. So I think the promises made when we first invested into the Z system, Z6 and Z7, was the fact that it was phase detect and a mirrorless camera is going to have this wonderful autofocus system. Well, it has a reasonable autofocus system, but it's certainly not up there with the competitors. And quite frankly, I'm feeling a little bit uh, disappointed and, and almost cheated that we're having to wait and wait and wait. And what, we're asked to spend $10,000 on another camera now, just so we can get the autofocus that we were promised years ago. Uh, that's a bit rude, really, I think. It's a bit uh, shameful on them. It's almost like they're holding everybody to ransom. So anyway, we've got what we've got and we'll make do with that. Uh, I'm sure the autofocus will be upgraded in the Z6 and Z7-2s very soon and they will become astoundingly good as well. I'm just a bit uh, sad on the delaying. The endless waiting is a bit uh, awkward. But the performance of the Z system is great. Now some of the other features of the Z9, for example, uh, that people might be excited about were the fact that it's got the grip. So it has this uh, big grip, pro-level grip for your portrait and vertical photography but as you see I don't use that grip I made a grip up of my own that I'm very comfortable with so you know these uh, battery grips they're not really that exciting for me they just add a lot of bulk in the camera bag and make things awkward to travel around and really increase the whole volume of the camera and after all what was the point of going mirrorless it really was to have something a little bit lighter and uh, and more compact so making a camera huge and making it mirrorless is well, it does seem a little odd doesn't it so uh, anyway that battery grip idea doesn't particularly excite me whether it be built in or even an accessory that you can get for the Z7 too and Z6 too. Uh, the other features that are pretty exciting about it is this stack sensor which I think will give great performance options in the future. Uh, that's something that's not going to trickle down I don't believe to the Z7 system because they, I think they're going to want to have that step up to the pro level system so even though we may get some technical features trickle down uh, I don't think we're going to get that new sensor in the Z7 system so I think they're going to have to leave it so that there is a, a raised bar for the pro level uh, gear I think that's reasonable and for the twice the money you're paying uh, that's quite fair too on that system I just want you to think if you've been considering uh, purchasing the Z9 and you think oh wow I really like all those features uh, just keep in mind, of course, that a lot of those features you'll probably never use. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, $10,000 and what are you really getting that you didn't already have? Well, you're, you're getting a faster shooting rate, which is fantastic if you actually need a faster shooting rate. For me, 10 frames a second is more than adequate for what I do. 
Uh, I think if I can't get a shot in 10 frames a second, I'm doing something horribly wrong. But, uh, you know, if 30 does it for you and that's what you need to get a great shot, to get the exact moment, you're a sports action photographer, then that's terrific. You go ahead right and buy that because that's, that's your niche in the market. But it's not my niche in the market. I do mostly portraits and landscapes. And, of course, uh, high-speed uh, photography is no part of that equation. So that's not particularly interesting to me. So I don't like the uh, built-in battery grip at all in the Z9. That's not interesting at all. So there's not too many features that I really care about. The flip screen, no, not doesn't help me in any way at all. Uh, so if I do video, I have a monitor on top of my cameras and I can have that uh, rotating 360 degrees in any direction I like. So the uh, idea of a little bit of a tiltier screen uh, makes little or any difference to me. The only feature in the Z9 that I actually find of uh, interest and exciting is the autofocus and as I've said I think that's going to trickle down at least reasonably level to the Z6 and Z7 twos. so I'll just have to wait for that even if it's uh, six months away it'll be worth the wait when it eventually does come so what you've got to weigh up on the balance and this is what I'm helping people to think about is not get caught up in the hype and the emotion of having the best of everything all in one camera because you probably find that you just don't use those features very often uh, so uh, thinking about the fact of the uh, cost of the unit, we're talking about a unit that's $10,000 Australian or $7,000 US, when you can think you can buy two Z7 twos for the same money, what are you better off with? One all-in-one camera or having two cameras? So you can have two shooting angles or uh, two different lenses on two cameras ready to go at a moment's notice. Uh, the two camera with the two lenses on it feature is a really great option to have when you're out uh, doing a, an event or weddings or something like that. So uh, that's something to consider value for money. What really do you want to spend your money on? Keep this in mind and this might blow you away if you haven't thought about it. You can have three Z6 twos for the cost of one Z9. Just let that sink in for a second. So you could have a forward camera. If you're doing video, we're talking video here. You've got a camera facing straight on. You can have a camera on the side angle giving you a profile shot, maybe at a different focal length. And you can have a camera in front of you where you're illustrating and explaining it, all for the same money as one Z9. Hmm, I'm pretty sure I know which way I'd like to go. So that's just something to think about, isn't it? The various different options you could spend that money on, things that you will actually use every day, or do you want to spend all that money on features you might use once or twice a month? Hey, that's something to think about, hey. So I'm not ditching on the uh, Z9. Don't, don't think for a second. I don't think it's an amazing camera and won't be awesomely uh, useful and practical for many wildlife action photographers or sports action photographers. But let's face it, these guys are probably about 2 or 3% of the Nikon market. Uh, the rest of us might be buying a Z9 just because we can, just because it's the latest novelty. And I'm just recommending that they may, that may not be the best value for money for you. You're probably better off spending that extra money on a spare camera like a Z6 II or a Z7 II and a 70-200 to or something like that. Maybe that's better value for money for you. So uh, just keep your minds open and, and make sure you, when you spend your money, you spend it on something you're actually going to use every day and it'll be real value to you. Yes, and while we're talking about the uh, Z9, for example, the Z9 also has the feature of 8K video. And that's another thing that uh, I just find completely useless at the moment, currently. I think in several years it might be a standard feature, just like 4K was when 1080 was ruling. 4K was all very exciting and now it seems to be an industry standard, doesn't it? Uh, but 8K I think is several years away. And the reason I mention that is uh, I know that uh, I, I don't have an 8K TV. I'm sorry, nor do I have an 8K monitor. Nor do I have a computer, I think, that would even process 8K. Uh, the moment I'm running at 4K, 60 frames a second for my computer, I'm saying, to be able to process. But whether that'll actually even function with 8K video, I can't say. So, quite frankly, the 8K feature sounds all very sexy and exciting. But being that there's no practical application for it immediately, or in the foreseeable future in a hurry, I think I'll just wait off a few years on that one. Uh, maybe when the 8K uh, comes also at 60 frames a second or something, then it could be a lot more interesting. And when I've had to upgrade my computer and monitors and TVs at home, and I know everybody else has also done the same, so I think maybe three to five years 8K will be very interesting. But right now I think it's just a gimmick and we don't really need that. What we need is 
this good quality 4K that seems to be what everybody's utilizing at the moment and I think that's more than satisfactory. So again, that's one of those features that sounds all very sexy uh, when you look at the statistics, but probably completely useless for most people. And think about this, I mentioned the pricing again and the camera options you can have. If you've got two cameras as I do, or more, then what you can do is, rather than shoot an 8K and say, look, I can shoot a wide angle in 8K, and then I can crop in and get a tight shot as well. Well, yes, you can do that, but you don't need to spend $10,000 on one camera to do that. What you can also do is have two cameras uh, of more affordable, like two Z6.2s or a couple of Z7.2s for the same price, and you can have one with a 70 to 200, and one with a 24 to 70, and you get two shots anyway. You get a wider shot, say at 50 mils with the 24 to 70, and then you can do a more tighter in close head shot uh, for zooming in effect uh, with the 70 to 200, and maybe at 100 mils. And so therefore you're accomplishing the same thing, just using two cameras to do it, and then you also get an immediate redundancy because you've got two cameras. So even though you might say, oh yeah, well I've got a redundancy with the Z9 because it has the two uh, CF Express cards. Well, that's true. It does have that. But what if the camera's faulty? What if the lens plays up or there's some other function? You've got no redundancy then, do you? You've just got two lots of faulty footage. Whereas if you've got two completely independent cameras and lenses, you've got a much better chance of saying I've got true redundancy because it's unlikely both will go kabang in the same moment. So there's, uh, again, we're talking about options and choices and how you can accomplish the same thing as a Z9 with two uh, Z7s or Z6s. Well, you can. You've just got to think a little bit out of the box differently. And I actually think it's a superior system because with the two cameras, as I've mentioned before, uh, you can have two different camera angles as well, as well as two different perspectives or focal lengths. So that's great. With the Z9, if that's all you can afford to have, you're getting one camera angle and you might be able to crop but then you're certainly not able to have a different camera angle. So different cameras mean different angles, different options, and I think that's actually the way I'm going to go with it. I won't be spending $10,000 on one new toy that only has features I'll use once or twice a month if I'm lucky. I'd much rather have something that I'm going to be using every day and can do everything I need all the time. So that's just something I wanted to put out there. The other thing I want to talk about with Nikon is there's rumours, of course, uh, that's coming out with a new FTZ adapter. Now you see it here, I've got the uh, FTZ adapter uh, on this uh, D-series lens. So I'll just place that down safely. I'm showing you here the FTZ adapter. And I want to talk about it because uh, this actually works extremely well. I've had it since the thing first came out and I've been very happy with its performance. And I've been using it on this uh, old D-series lens because it has a silent wave motor in it. And uh, even though it's a screw drive lens, I can use it on the FTZ adapter and the mirrorless cameras because it has its own internal motors. So that's great. But in these things, people have often complained. They say, oh yeah, well the problem with these FTZ adapters is they don't have the screw drive in them. So you can't then run the old D lenses. And Nikon may, when they bring out the new FTZ adapter, have a screwdriver option in it. Well, I'm sorry, I just don't believe that. I don't believe a word of that. I can't see Nikon including a screwdriver system in their FTZ adapters so that, what, people can go out and buy obsolete uh, lenses that they're discontinuing? How does that help Nikon? And as far as all the older lenses goes, they're claiming that the Z lenses are superior in every way optically. So why would they want to encourage you to use something inferior? There's nothing wrong with these lenses, don't misunderstand. I have, the reason I have one is because I like them and I use them. But at the same time, if you could have a Z lens instead, you're probably better off doing so. And it's certainly better off for Nikon because they're selling new brand, lens, brand new lenses. So why would they do that? That would just be insane. Uh, if you want to use your, your old uh, D lenses with the screw drive, then keep your DSLRs. Keep your old D810 or whatever it is and use them on that. But don't expect to use them on your mirrorless system uh, efficiently. So what I think they're going to do with the new FTZ adapter, and I believe they will release one, because uh, this has an inherent fault in it. And the fault is nothing to do with optically, because there's no optics. <laughs> but there's no glass in there, it's just a mount adapter. But what is faulty with it is that they've made this mount. They thought they were doing everybody a favour. They've come up with this um, lump on the bottom here with a screw in it, and they think, uh, screw, you know, what is it, a one quarter hole, and they thought that's great for putting your monopods or something in or mounting a tripod mount, but it's actually just been a complete pain in the bum. It's just in the way, annoying, interferes with your grip, interferes with your changing of your lenses. It's just a hideous, monstrous design for floor. 
and I believe the new one will come out and they'll just eradicate that out and it'll be a perfectly spherical shape, which means it doesn't obtrude anything. So for those who have the battery grip, you know, they go put their hand and then, oh, it's in the way, this lump's in the way, it's annoying. You try and change various different mounts and then your lenses and you've got a, uh, a bracket on the bottom of your camera and you can't get it on and off and it hits it and that's what they're going to change. So the only thing I believe they're going to change if there's the adapter is removing that lumpy mount and just have it perfectly a uh, spherical unit. Uh, so I just thought I'd point that out if you thought that uh, they were going to include a screw drive system in this thing. I think you're dreaming. Uh, I'm not trying to be offensive or trying to disappoint you but so they're just going to uh, make this as simple for themselves as possible to sell more lenses so I can't see them doing anything else than removing the bump. And you know what, when they remove the bump, I'm gonna be all happy about that because that has been a bit of a dang nuisance when it comes to uh, mounting stuff for myself as well. So uh, other than that, that's really all I had to say. Uh, anything you'd like to contribute and add, you want me to try something out for you, please let me know because I'm always happy to help and discuss any subject you would like. So you have yourself a good day and I look forward to uh, seeing you in my next video.